to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Today on the show, I have another interior designer who, like many of you, comes to interior design as a second career. Courtney McLeod is the principal of Right Meets Left Interior Design in New York City. And although Courtney had a lifelong passion for the decorative arts, she first earned a business degree from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and she pursued a successful 15-year career in the financial services industry rising to a leading portfolio management role in real estate private equity. Despite her success at the peak of her career, she knew it was time to pursue her true passion, designing beautiful interiors. And she went ahead using the skills gained through her experience, her transferable skills, just like Erica Ward taught us in episode six, and enhanced them with her design-related studies at Parsons, Pratt, and the New York School of Interior Design, together with with these all bundled up into one package, she confidently embarked on a new course and has never looked back. Now, before I introduce you to Courtney, I want to remind you that a well-designed business podcast is coming up on its third birthday party this year in February. And our show sponsor, Kravit, is having a big party for us in New York City at the D&D building on February 5th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. It's a party is free. There's no ticket price, but you absolutely must must RSVP because the space is limited. Okay. So I hope that you'll join us if you want information on how to do it and how to do the RSVP. Go to luannnigara.com. Click on events and coaching and then click on attend a live event. You'll see this event right there along with the dates for all of the events that I've got coming up in the first quarter of 2019. So I'm going to be in Las Vegas at KBIS. I'm going to be at Lucas Alexander Showroom in Philly. I'm going to be at Waterworks in the Boston Design Center. And of course, I'm going to be at the IWC in Nashville. It's all there. So first though, uh, first stop on this tour is February 5th, New York City at the Kravitz Showroom for the birthday party. I sure hope you'll come out to meet me, introduce yourself to me, and that we get a chance to chat. All righty. Now, let me introduce you to Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, so it's a real delight for me to be joining you. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. And I also want to give a shout out to two people that we're both huge fans of. Uh, Gail Davis is the, the is a designer who's been on the show, and she's a friend of mine and a friend of yours, and she introduced us by bringing you to Window Works for yes. the Lunch and Learn that Nicole Heimer of Curio Electro was running, right? Yes. Two fabulous ladies. Hi, Gail. Hi, Nicole. (laughs) I know. I know. Huge fan club here of these two women. So, and then also to our common friends of Byron and Tiffany of Cordero Consulting. And so shout out to them as well. They are the best. Yes. And here's the thing. Tiffany reached out to me and she said, you know, we're working with Courtney McLeod and we really think she'd be great for the podcast. And, you know, everybody thinks their people are going to be great for the podcast. Just saying, right? (laughs) (laughs) And so I'm reading it and then I'm like, oh, she comes from the financial background. Oh, real estate background. Oh, she has a six step process. Slam dunk. Let's have this lady. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, this was, you have me at hello moment because here's what I know, Courtney, and you know it from listening to the show too, is that 
as business owners, we all have, whether we've defined it or not, we have a sort of a system. So the smart ones have defined it, but all of us, even if we're not really have it defined yet, we sort of have a system for going through a project. But the the differentiator that I believe that really enables an interior designer to scale up and start to charge higher fees and make more money and be more profitable and attract more successful projects is when they recognize line in the sand, let me enunciate my system, let me own it internally and let me project it out to my potential clients. Do you agree with that? It's so true. And, you know, for me, it it did take time to get there, Mm. to figure out what is my process. And, you know, I think every designer approaches the process a little bit differently. And I, you know, so I certainly didn't emerge fully formed. (laughs) Right. None of us do, by the way. You know, yeah. And I'm by no means at the end either. This will continue to evolve. But Once I made the decision and really, you know, put thought and focus on, okay, let me sit down and define the process first for myself and then for my clients, it was absolutely transformative. And um, not only in terms of my own efficiency and how I run my business, but I think also the types of clients I've been getting and, you know, the, the types of, um, uh, you know, so, sort of how the process runs throughout has been different because I feel more confident in, um, you know, guiding the client because they know where they are in the process, but I also know where I am in the process. And um, so, yeah, so I think it gives a lot of comfort, not only, you know, outside of the firm, but also for us internally. And I have to say, I recall Rachel Cannon saying the exact same thing thing. She Mm -hmm. literally said, once I took everything that I knew and what I did and put it into a defined process, it was the, the, it literally was the night and day switch for the firm taking off. It really, and it's, it's so impactful and it's not just you know, sort of on paper numbers or the physical, it's also your confidence Mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. I think it really helps. And at the end of the day, it's about the confidence that that you exude. Um, I think that's a big part of, you know, why people put their faith and their trust and quite frankly, their financials (laughs) Mm -hmm. in your hands. Mm -hmm. Um, And so everything that you can use, every tool at your disposal to build your confidence and to help you communicate that to the world and to existing and potential clients. It, it, it's a, such a huge benefit. I cannot say how, how big it's been for us. It's very true because we, I know from when I coach designers one-on-one and they often will say to me, how do I make that difference? How do I make that gap? How do I go from this type of project to that type of project? And the truth is, I think they think I'm full of crap because I say over and over again, (laughs) when you have defined your systems and you stand in them and you communicate them and you feel the confidence that comes internally from knowing this is your system, then it is the moment. It is because two things happen, right? Here's the two things that I believe happen. You tell me what you think. Not only, as you just said, it helps you with your own confidence, right? But having having the confidence is the one little step before raising your fees and the one little step before turning down the projects that you know don't serve you. And so the thing is, it's like a chicken and an an egg thing. And I always say, yes, the confidence is the, the, the flipping point, but how you get the confidence is to have a confident set of systems for running your business. Like, right? Oh my goodness. Yes, yes, yes. Let me scream it from the rooftop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, what you just said 
is exactly what has happened and is happening in my business mm. right now. I mean, I, it, it, I've got chills right now. Yes. <laughs> well, and it's funny um, because I think sometimes as business people, we're searching for something that must be more complicated than that. And yes. it really isn't. But you know what, Luann, I will say that it isn't a, at least for me, it wasn't a, a straight line from A to B Agreed. process. Agreed. Um, it, I tried to sort of get there a few times over the years, um, but it took trial and error mm. to figure out what really worked. And I, I have to give you a shout out. Um, I, gosh, I wish I, I remembered which uh, episode it was, but one of your guests talked about um, you know, approaching everything, not tailoring everything to the client, but tailoring everything to you, mm, yeah. to understanding what works for you. And that was like a magic moment for me. And I think that that was like the spark that enabled me to develop the process that I have now that works really well for me. And, you know, because it works, works well for me, it therefore works well for the client. Right. And it therefore attracts the client that aligns with you because yes. that's process that you like and works yes. for you works for them. Right? Yes. And yes. I agree. I don't mean to imply by any stretch of the imagination that just make a system and then you'll be amazing. <laughs> you know, like, nope. <laughs> but the thing it, it is, to, be, go ahead. It can be really frustrating. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. It can be, um, you know, just why can't I get this right? You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making a quote unquote system. And so then automatically things should be, you know, falling into place. And, you know, I think we just, it's okay to have that, you know, uncertain time. So I, you know, just for anyone out there who's going through that, it's okay. And in fact, you won't get to the process that works for you. I don't think without going through a bit of that trial and error. Agreed. And and the thing is that the, well, you know what I just, I, I say it, I have it on my website, I, uh, my WindowWorks website, I've said it on the show before. An expert is, a, is the person who's made all the mistakes in a particular field, right? Yes. I mean, and so you cannot just pop out and expect to bring all of this to the table. I, I think for me, what I continue to try and hammer is please don't resist that this is that little switch this is there are many switches that help you you know f you know you know it's like starting an airplane the, the pilot at the beginning is like flipping 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 you know he does 10 buttons and then the plane will start right but yep. don't resist that one of the most important switches to flip is the establishing of your system. And I have listened to and spoken to designer after designer try and say, well, I've got to get my Instagram going and I've got to get this and I've got that and then this will happen. And I'm just, and I just, I just say point blank. All of that is after this switch. Okay. Yes. Right. Agreed? Yes. And I wish that I had focused more energy on this earlier on. Mm hmm you know, if I could go back, cause I was absolutely that designer that you're talking about. <laughs> I said, yep, my Instagram is banging. I've got, you know, I'm doing things and let me put this in the back burner. Cause it's kind of painful and That's it's not right. very it's fun. And, and I don't want to, you know, focus on it too much, but you know, you go through, you have difficulties and, you know, you have some projects that go well and some projects that don't. And then at some point you have to kind of have that conversation with yourself and say, okay, what is my responsibility here mm -hmm. and why have, you know, X, Y, and Z happened. Mm -hmm. And I think once you do that, it, the clarity comes, it's, it's surprising. Like it really, you know, if, if, if you're open to the process and again, I go back to that, to that guest that you had that talked about, you know, focusing on what, what works for you mm -hmm. versus trying to be everything to everyone, you know, trying to tailor yourself to each individual client and do it exactly the way they think it should be done. Right. You're going to drive yourself crazy. Right. And I, I drive myself crazy. Right. And what I don't <laughs> like about that is, is that 
That is to me, we, they, we've been in a common theme lately on the show is talking about food in preparation in relation to what you guys do. And to me, that's like a, a renowned chef that is working at a, a, an upscale restaurant or even a pizza parlor guy. Let's be real. He, you know, you love the way his pizza is made. You love the way his pizza is made. You come there for that style, that taste, that combination of ingredients. You don't walk in and say, well, I mean, if you put a little extra sugar in the sauce today, that will be great. And if you do this and then the next day. The point is that to what you just said, when you establish how you do it, what works for you, and you repeat that over and over again, it becomes the thing that gels everything and makes it so that a client feels safe within the process because they're in a process and that makes them feel safe. Absolutely. And, you know, we have to remember this is a big financial investment. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a lot of money. They have to trust you. Right. You know, And, and so use every tool at your disposal to get to that trust. Because once they trust you, the heavens open and, you know, suddenly not only do they trust you in terms of investing their money um, in a smart way, but also in terms of your creativity. And so you show them that, you know, amazing wallpaper and suddenly they're like, oh, well, you know, I don't know, but, you know, I trust you. (laughs) Right, right. You know, it's, it's interesting the way, the way that works, but I found it to be incredibly important and effective. Well, and because you've presented yourself as a trustworthy, but that there is something that they can hang on to that can be trusted. So just like you trust the pizza guy to make it the same way each time, and that's why you go back, they tr- they can hear and feel that you have a roadmap. You know where you're going. Okay, I might not know anything about an interior design project, but she does, as opposed mm-hmm. to the designer, like you said, when you're earlier in your career and you're like, well, client A, you want to do it this way, and client B, you want to do it that way. I'll just change with the wind. That's... There's no trust there. There's and, and the thing is, in the beginning, you can kid yourself that you're being helpful, that you're being service orientated, that you're being compliant and making it good for the client's experience by adapting everything you do to them. But the reality is, is that it's just... It's just like everything else. You're the professional. They come to you to know that you are going to do it a certain way that you've enunciated it and you can repeat it, right? It's true. And I find that if it is a a subtle but constant understanding, it helps. Like you don't have to be a bulldozer about it. You know, you don't a drill sergeant at all. You know, I have a a generally a softer touch. Um, it, It works for me. And, you know, but if I am gentle, but firm, (laughs) gentle, but firm, it, it works. And again, you just sort of say, let's go back, you know, here we are in the process, you know, this is where we are, this, you know, you just sort of keep reinforcing that. And it helps them, but it also gives you a little bit of backup. Right. You know, you can say, it's not just me telling you this, you know, this is part of a bigger plan. Right, right, right. And that's the truth. It does have to come within your own personal style. So no different than a kindergarten teacher is gently but firmly not going to run, let 26 kids run amok, but she's not going to beat them over the head and talk to them the way you would talk to a 15 year old. Right. So there's a way and it's, Hey, we do this and then we do this and then we do this. We don't go to lunch after, you know, morning, you know, pledge of allegiance that comes later. And it's no different in the project with you. It's like, well, no, Mr. and Mrs. Client, this is the next step. And then we can get to there. So you know what? You also, start to attract the clients who work well with that so that they fit your style. You know, the clients you're working with are fitting your style. And, you know, another unexpected thing that happened, you know, as I got more confident with the process was getting more confident with more clearly and wholly embracing my style as well, Hmm. you know, because from a creative side, for, for a long time, I thought, gosh, I, I want to just kind of be everything to everyone creatively. Mm-hmm. And, 
yes, I can do a beautiful neutral room. I can do texture. I can do all of that. But color is my thing. And that's okay. In fact, that's a great thing. And so I've really made an effort to put that out there. If you look at my Instagram, it's color, color, color. You know, you look at my portfolio, it's happy, joyful color. And, you know, it hasn't, you know, dampened my business. If anything, it's expanded it because people come to me and they say, oh, I'm a little afraid and I don't want to be, you know, can you help me get there? And so I, I think that the creative confidence also grew unexpectedly from having confidence in the process. Nice. And that's really t- talking about the way you lead with your color and you express it and you show it. You don't shy away from it. That's that's calling out a, a, a sub niche right there. That's yep. leaning into it. And like you said, so the A, the person that's attracted to it and is already confident with it and is, well, I found the lady for me. But then, <laughs> as you said, the, the, the client that's attracted to it but scared to death but sees that she's in, he or she is in good hands based on the work that the, you are showing. So that's awesome. I love that. And so you don't worry about doing one more white room. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like what you want to do, right? And and by the way, it's not so easy to put together a white room. I'm not disparaging that one bit. It's, it's not. And, and you also... Not easy at all. It's not. It's, it's quite difficult. But it's also... Um, you won't necessarily not get that client either. In fact, one of, one of my... I love this client I'm working with right now, we're doing her loft in Chelsea and she was beige, beige, you know, a little gray beige. (laughs) And for the most part, it's a pretty neutral space. And, but I've gently introduced, you know, color that she's comfortable with, but in general, it's, it's still very neutral. So, you know, I thought that I would never get that neutral client if I put my color foot forward, mm-hmm. but I haven't found that to be the case at all. Okay, so you're still attracting all ends, but then and and even in that, you're you're respecting the client, but you still are your aesthetic is coming through. Yes. Is what you're saying? Okay. Yes, okay. and it's become a really wonderful process, and and it's I think the space is even better because of it. Nice, I love it. So. These six steps, understanding you, creative focus, seamless execution, construction oversight, finale, and closure meeting. I really want to make sure that we hit one and six. The others we can get to. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. (laughs) But I want to hit number one and six. So tell us a little bit about number one, understanding you. Yeah. And, you know, phase one, I, I very specifically and intentionally called it understanding you because I wanted to establish from the beginning that our process isn't to come in and and railroad you or, or push you into something that doesn't fit your lifestyle or your style. Our entire goal is to understand you and to elevate your style. And so I wanted clients to know and to, again, trust that keyword trust, um, that I would be listening. And so phase one is really all about listening and understanding what are their goals, what is their style, and if they don't, if they can't articulate it, you know, using our process to help them articulate it, um, understanding where they are financially, are there, um, you know, specific time deadlines, you know, what exactly is this project, what is your goal, and how can we help you? And through phase one, Answering all of those questions sets us up for a successful project that gets us to, you know, a, a fabulous and, and a happy client closure meeting. Okay. So phase one is critical. And so how do you execute phase one? It starts with the first mm-hmm. contact into the firm by the client or phase yes. one. Tell us about it. It starts with the first contact into the firm. Um, generally, I'll either do a phone call. Usually, it's a phone call, or they'll come into the office, um, and it's really like a getting to know you call. Um, it's you know asking them about the project, um, you know understanding the scope, the location, um, what they're looking for, their expectations, talking a bit about um, budget and if that's realistic, um, and and really just kind of trying to suss out if the project could be a good fit for us. And um, depending on, you know, sort of how much information or the scope of the project or or sort of the scale of the project, 
um, I can either go straight to a proposal from that conversation or we'll go to a site visit and then to a proposal. Okay. And so then once we have, you know, the proposal and everyone's on board and, and we're good to go, um, the very first thing I send out is our welcome packet. And in the welcome packet, it basically has a questionnaire that, you know, asks them, you know, the basics, the, who's the contact person? Do you like, you know, to, do you prefer phone or email? You know, th that kind of practical stuff. And then we also ask, you know, what's your favorite color? You know, where do you like to travel? You know, all those sorts of background questions. And um, we also put in there, we re-articulate our process. So our process is, is really outlined in detail in the proposal. And then we give it to them again <laughs> okay. in the welcome packet. So it's okay. You saw this before. You're this is like the third time you're seeing this. <laughs> I love it. Um, and in our welcome packet, we also have our rules of the road. Um, and it's a little sheet that this is another um, that uh, idea that I got from your podcast. And, <laughs> you know, again, it, it gently but firmly says, you know, these are our hours. This is, you know, how we like to work. It's, you know, talks about trusting the process. And, you know, at the very end, I say, you know, let's have a joyful experience. Nice. And so it's, it's, again, it's setting the tone for the project. And then we have our initial client meeting. And, and this is really where we get into the, the nitty gritty. Um, because we have that pre-questionnaire, um, you know, I have a little bit of a feel for what I'm getting into. If they have any Pinterest boards or anything like that, I've asked them to, you know, please send that to us in advance of the meeting. And um, from there, we go through, you know, another set of questions. We talk in more detail about budget um, and scope, and we um, go through initial design concept ideas. Um, and so what I really like to do with clients is to walk them through a series of photographs of spaces all different styles, you know, all different sort of levels of, of, you know, cost. And by doing that, I, it helps them to articulate what they like and to see things that they didn't know they like, but then they have a really strong positive or negative reaction to something. And they say, Oh, I would have, I, you know, hadn't even thought of that, but yeah, you know, I, I really, that's a great idea. And so that's been a really helpful tool. Um, I don't know if a lot of designers do that. Maybe that's pretty typical, but that's something that has been very, very helpful for us. Um, and so we take all of that information. And after that initial client meeting, we put together um, a detailed scope. We do an initial budget allocation. We do our design concept boards and we um, do a furniture plan. And then we have a second client meeting to review all of that. And I find that if we're on the same page with those items, then we are rocking and rolling and we're ready to go. And so that's what the whole phase one is all about. Okay. All right. So now I got to go back and pick it apart. Okay. Sure. You ready? All right. Sure. So, <laughs> so when you are, the first thing that occurs to me, you said in the first contact, the get to know you conversation, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about scope and budget and location and goals, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. How you said sometimes you can go straight to proposal mm -hmm. from that. And yes. so proposal, does that include the fees and things like that? Like, how are you, what, what is proposal? Okay. So, so, so proposal is our design services agreement. So that includes fees that includes everything. And in order to go from call to proposal um, by email, we have received um, you know, detailed photography of the space. We've received, you know, if there's some sort of floor plan available, um, they've sent us, you know, some Pinterest boards for reference. They've sent us a lot okay. of information. So it's for that client that is pretty organized and prepared so that we have enough to be able to price the project, but we have okay. to really be able to understand the scope to, to do that. Okay. So that makes more sense. Okay. I'm thinking we're having a nice, how do you, how do you do phone call? And I'm like, what, how did we price that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be for clients that are out of, out of town or out of state yes. and they've got a project in Manhattan and they, yes. you know, going to do a loft, like you said, but their primary residence is wherever. Okay. Yes. Um, righty. So, so that happens. And then we get this welcome packet. 
Oh, no. Then we go to site visit. And then after the proposal, so at the propo- at, once the proposal goes out, they sign it. Yes. And are they giving you money at this point? Yes. We take a retainer, which we hold to the end of the project. Okay. And how do you decide what the size of that retainer is? Do you have set guidelines or it, how do you do that, Courtney? So this is something that I learned from the fabulous um, Kimberly Sheldon. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I tie it to how much I think one to two months of fees would be Okay. so that let's say we get down the road and, you know, we bill monthly. And so, you know, we, we bill and then we're not paid. So at most we'll continue to work for that next month while we try to work that out with the client, but we will stop work at that second billing. And so having that retainer protects me in the event that for whatever reason, the client doesn't want to move forward or they, you know, are reluctant to pay. I haven't been in this situation before, but in the worst case scenario, I'm protected. Okay. Okay. And the, one to two months worth of fees is it based on the so it's based on the number of hours you expect to put in on that project times your hourly fee yes okay and do you go as as um deep as okay me courtney i'm the principal i expect to work on this project 20 hours and my fee is x per hour and my assistant i expect to work on it 30 hours and her fee is x is that how detailed do you go or do you just assume it's 50 hours and you put it all at your rate no i am um a a math geek at heart (laughs) (laughs) so i have a whole excel spreadsheet (laughs) okay where I have, you know, my process and then subcategories detailed and I have myself and my assistant and then like admin cost. And then I say, okay, I allocate the number of hours that I estimate. And it's because it's a spreadsheet, it's pretty easy to drop the hours in there and then automatically calculates. And that's how I do it. Okay. And so when we're talking about dropping the hours into the spreadsheet, we're talking about if it's say a 3000 square foot apartment. Okay. you it's a master bedroom, a living room, a dining room, and a guest bedroom and you know, two bathrooms. Okay. So you're going to say, typically, you know, from experience, you know, from tracking hours, this is a question, not a statement that it's going to take me 10 hours to source for a master bedroom, 10 hours to source for a living room, four hours to source for a guest bedroom. Is that what we're talking about? And you're dropping those into the spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. So my spreadsheet is by room and by room, I'll have sort of generic, like if it's a bedroom, I'll have like bed, nightstand, dresser, rug, lighting, you know, uh, bedding. And then I'll, I'll just sort of generic and then I'll drop in, this will take me two hours, three hours, an hour. Or I I get pretty granular about it. um, And that's really based on just experience, Mm -hmm. um, you know, having done this for a little while now. um, And yeah, it's, it's, it's an estimate. I mean, you know, obviously, but I try to, to get as detailed as possible so that when you roll it up, it makes sense. Because if I just put, oh, it'll take me 25 hours to do this bedroom. I mean, what that doesn't mean anything to me. If I can't break it down and really understand, okay, yeah, realistically, it's going to take me, you know, X hours to to find the right bed or, you know what I mean? So I, I think sitting down and, and having a list that says, you know, a living room, bedroom, guest room, and then just putting hours to it, you know, to my mind, that isn't enough. Okay. So you're getting all the way down to how long it takes to source a nightstand, a rug, a a dresser, a a bed cover, a la la la. And again, you know, it's, it's fairly standardized, (laughs) you know, so it's, it sounds like it would take a ton of time to do that. But once you set up your spreadsheet, it's pretty quick to kind of go in and say, okay, you know, well, this is what it, you know, I did on the last project, or this is what I typically do. And then I'll go in and make adjustments. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not that onerous to do. 
Well, um, it comes from information. You have to track yourself doing this often enough to actually know. It's like counting your calories. You have to count you, the Twitch you bar. You can't leave it out. You do. <laughs> and it's, it's so worth it as um, an exercise because mm. you're not just doing it to price it at the beginning. I'm using that tool all the way through. You know, to and keep I'm you on track so you don't go down rabbit holes. I said I would totally. put two and a half hours to find a headboard and I'm on my t- second hour. Lock it down, lady. Right. Yes. Or I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I got to rob Peter to pay Paul somewhere. It's totally. It's going to take me five hours to figure out this bed. So I better be fast, you know, on this other spot. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a tool for 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 you all the way through. So I think the investment of time is is really worth it. So that's a great distinction is that a newer interior designer might say, well, I could say it would take me four hours to figure out the bed, you know, situation, but it ended up taking me seven and now I'm completely off course. And you're saying course correct somewhere else, lock something else down, take three things that you allotted two hours for and somehow just make the decision in an hour for each thing. Yes. And don't be afraid to try this exercise earlier on, you know, Mm -hmm. like estimate, do do your best guesstimate Mm -hmm. and then try to use that as a guide. And if you, if you do that and you're working on a project or two and you're finding, oh my gosh, I'm just so far off, Mm. that's information. Right. But don't feel like you have to wait to have 50 data points to start this exercise today. Start this exercise right now. And I'm telling you, it will benefit you. Exactly. And I don't know if you heard the episode recently on Power Talk Friday with Monique Holmes, where she, with the episode was called How to Resource Like a Pro. And she suggests that, and I love this idea, by the way, she suggests that in your free time, when you're not in a project maybe you're in between projects or it is something you're doing while you know your husband is watching the football game you're sourcing okay let me see if i can find three beds that are in this particular style that are in three different price points medium low and high and then do all that and then collect these resources so that when now two weeks later you have a project you're like oh that bed would be great for that project or at least i know from putzing around that website for that particular vendor that there are things that i like there as opposed to starting from scratch each time how do you feel about that Absolutely. It's so, so true. And that's why I also think it's really important for designers, for us in general, to allocate time for just knowing what's out there. You know, just going to the showrooms or going to High Point or doing internet research and just understanding what vendor has what. Mm -hmm. You know, because if I'm thinking, okay, I'm doing a bedroom, I have a $3,000 budget for the bed, okay what vendors are, are, am I going to go to? And this is the the style, you know, Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. at a certain point you start to say, Oh yeah, I know. Okay. Oli, they probably have a good bed or made goods or, you know, century or wherever you start to get a shorthand and you become more efficient, but you have to sort of practice it before you get there. So you you almost have to be inefficient before you can become efficient. Well, and it's the truth. And when we had that show, and if you go back and listen to that episode with Monique Holmes, I'll put it in the um, summary of the show today, the episode number. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it was I I compared it to sports. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, if you are playing, whether you're playing t-ball or baseball, you don't just go out on game day and expect to hit a home run. You put in hours and hours and hours of practice with the batting coach, with, you know, everybody, you know, taking hit after hit after hit. So when it's game time, you can get up and within three strikes, get a home run, right? It's true. And for me, this is an area where I feel like I'm actively evolving and it's, you know, definitely on my goal list for 2019 Mm. to hone down my source list Mm -hmm. so I can become more efficient with this. You know, I'm someone I I love to kind of late at night, I (laughs) go online and I'm like, oh, this new vendor, that new vendor, you know, and so I like to sort of discover new things. But, um, you know, if you have 50 vendors that do good beds, you know, it can get inefficient really quickly. <laughs> so, well, right, because now you really haven't honed it down. You're just, exactly. I picked 50, yay. It, exactly. So <laughs> and it's also like too, targeting in. 
Right. And also, too, from the standpoint of your business profitability, it makes a lot more sense to become important to three yes. resources than to be unimportant to 10 resources. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And this is I've been um, the last month or so. Of, I do up my sort of next year planning in the fourth quarter. And this has been such a big thing for me because of course we're all trying to squeeze out profitability everywhere we, we can. Um, and to date I have, with the exception of maybe a, one or two vendors, I've been, you know, a small vendor to a, a small buyer to a lot of vendors. Mm. And, you know, I want to change that. Right. And so that's something that is very front of mind for me right now. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a good business practice. It would be, yes. you know, you, I know for us at Window Works, we have, pro, you know, I, I, for categories, I might have 20 different categories that I have to purchase from in the course of our business but for window treatments, hard treatments, soft treatments, and awnings. But within each type, I don't have more than two or three vendors that I order from. And when somebody comes into my showroom to say, hey, we have another new line of cellular shades or we have a new line of woven shades, it's a hard sell to get me to go. <laughs> it really is. I mean, you have to be really exceptional and something really fabulous has to be happening for me to leave off of the one to sometime I only have one product, one vendor per product category. At most I have, I have three, but there is not a chance that I am going to order woven woods from 15 different manufacturers. Not happening. It, Boy, it, it's I like that. Yeah, it's inefficient in every way. It's inefficient in my clout, right? I don't I don't maximize my clout. So if I need a favor, so this is, you know, the, all of us, if you need a favor, you need a special um, situation, you need help with a rush or whatever, you don't have any clout. But also, too, it's inefficient in the execution. So for me, my installer has to know 15 different types of brackets and packaging and everything else. But even for you as a designer, what is their shipping policies? What is their return policy? Uh, what What is the delivery situation like it and all of those things to have to know it across 50 people for for beds I mean you can get that down to, to five yep. vendors for beds yep. I'm sorry and if you can't that's another conversation exactly 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 so I mean and you might like you said love to just in your off time, maybe you have taken the time in your off time to hone it down to three or four go-tos for beds. But that doesn't mean, it's like flipping a magazine. That doesn't mean in your off time you can't explore others. You might take one off the list and add one, but you just don't do Absolutely. it in the middle of a project, right? In the Absolutely. middle of the project, you go to your go to so you can be efficient. Absolutely. Right, right. And of course, we're not talking about that one off crazy pants thing where we really have to get something that we've never seen or heard of before, right? So, totally. So yeah. And that's, that's fun time. So, right, yeah, right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, I know. mean, honestly, usually if you're going down that road, then you're at a price point where you have a little more yes. flexibility. <laughs> Completely 100% custom. <laughs> what could we come up with? Okay. Love custom. I love it. It's good. It's good. Okay. So I love that you do the welcome packet after the proposal. I love that you're, you have the rules of the road and I'm going to tell you, I'll bet you when you said you heard that on the show, I'll bet you that was Rachel's show too. Rachel yes. Cannon had that same yes. thing. Yes. Yep. Yes. So here's the thing. So after that, um, then you have the initial client meeting and you have detailed talk about budget, design concept ideas, the walkthrough of the series of photographs. And so at this meeting, you are not coming with things, products, items that you have selected for them. You're coming through with ideas and this series of photographs to say, love that kind of kitchen, hate that kind of kitchen, love that kind of, you know, side chair, hate that kind of side chair, correct? That's right. It's really a very open conversation and it's an opportunity for exploration. And for us, for me, going through looking at a lot of different styles and reading their reaction, it's a lot of information, a lot mm -hmm. of information. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's one of the most valuable exercises for me so that I can go back and be pretty efficient on coming up with the concept because coming out of that meeting, I've got a pretty good idea who I'm working with. 
Okay. Okay. I like that. That's that's a very uh I love it because there's no emotion attached to the selection being p- positive or negative. It just is either positive or negative to them, subjective to them. Like it, and don't I, like it. Yeah, and I I even say, you know, before we start, I say, you know, tell me what you like, but even more importantly, in some cases, tell me what you don't like, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. if you have a sharp negative reaction to something, you know, share it. And so if you say that at the very beginning, it becomes kind of a fun exercise for, for clients. And, you know, by the, you know, fifth or sixth, you know, photo they're you know, yeah, I like that. I hate that. Right, 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 right. Then they, they, you're giving them the freedom to, to be, bold about it and not feel like they're hurting your feelings. You didn't pick these things for them. That's what I love about it. Nope. Right. No. Nope. Yeah. So that's and they awesome. aren't, you know, marrying themselves to anything. Yeah. So I, I find structuring a way you get very honest reactions. Right. I love it. Yeah. Kimberly always says when she's about to search for fabric for somebody before she has searched, she'll say, tell me what you're allergic to. Are you allergic to stripe? Are you allergic to flowers? Like, what do you hate? Right. <laughs> so now let me ask you something before we go to the other number six, which I want to hop over to. But before we leave this first part, sure. talk to me about since you set up a retainer based on the the fees that you expect to be the monthly fees, right? That's what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Are you mm-hmm. doing the whole process just on based on a flat fixed fee? Like how is the how are you pricing your projects? Yeah, so we do a a fixed fee that's billed over a monthly basis over a period of time, um, which is great because it gives us um, visibility into future cash flow. Um, it also helps the client to have, you know, a set schedule and they know when payments are due. And it helps us to know how much time we should be allocating to the project at each period. So, you know, at the very beginning, as we're understanding the scope, knowing again, you know, through a bit of experience, um, we can say, okay, based on what we've done in the past, you know, the first three months or the first six months are, you know, very, very busy. So this is, you know, these dollars are allocated to that and then it, you know, tapers off from there. So um, we do, you know, sort of a fixed fee on a schedule and um, we, you know, bill at a number of rates within that fixed fee when we're figuring it out and it's, you know, for principal, for junior designer or or admin time. Um, And then we... bill our clients for purchases, um, we uh, share our discount 50-50 with our clients. Um, I find that that creates a nice alignment of interests. And again, it helps to build trust. And then, of course, if it's custom items or, you know, auction items, uh, that's billed differently. But uh, basically, that's how we bill. Okay, so get me to, you know what happens. The newer designer, the newer entrepreneur is going to have that head swimming moment of how, how many hours does it take to do this? And of course, we've addressed that. They have to practice, they have to develop their skills in resourcing, create their library of go to and narrow down so that they they reduce that time of w- running in circles. But even still beyond that, um, there is, think back, you remember when it was more difficult to assess a project and how many hours it would take. And also addressing in that answer, Courtney, if you would, also address what happens when, well, uh, let's separate it first. Address that first. How? What is that? What is that magic potion for sure. really being able to start to make some good assessments on what you expect the hours to be? Sure. And I, I should also put a caveat that if it's a smaller project, you know, like a, a one room or something like, or just like a refresh, then it's hourly. Oh, we okay. don't do the fixed fee on a small project because. I found that it's just impossible to have enough cushion for yourself if you're doing something small. So, so that would be number one. Um, number two, I would say that if you are very new, bill hourly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bill hourly at the beginning. To, you know, it, it's the clients don't love it. It's a, it's more of a of a pain, but um, it's data and it's discipline 
and it's important. So don't, um, and, and I tried to do fixed fee very early on and I just got spanked. I mean, I just, I lost my shirt. And so, you know, our structure works better once you've had a bit of data and a bit of experience. So if you're starting out, my recommendation is don't, don't try to do a fixed fee. Okay. Just my two cents. Okay. So that's, that's good advice. And so what you're saying is, is that in the beginning you tried to do it because you've, you know, we're all been told, oh, do it, da, la, 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 yes. but yes. you are not efficient enough necessarily. And you are, because that's the follow-up question. The follow-up question that I get from, from newer interior designers all the time is when I establish my, you know, fixed fee, what happens when it, the whole project runs way over. <laughs> and so what you're saying mm -hmm. is that is a byproduct of having lesser experience unto itself. That is a byproduct. Part of it. And that's also why I like the monthly billing because, you know, and, and I, I have had this uh, happen recently where we were, you know, sort of doing the interior design in the living room and they said, oh, we want to do the kitchen. <laughs> right. That's kind of a big add on. <laughs> so, you know, we say, okay, sure. Um, that's going to add, you know, X number of months of fees at this rate to the project. Easy, very easy. Um, and so if the scope starts to creep, you can offer the client two options. You can say, okay, sure. We can tack that additional work on. And so we'll extend for an additional, you know, two or three months and the fees will continue to be charged for an additional two or three months, or we can increase the amount of time we're allocating to the project and the monthly fee will go up. Okay. So either way, you know, assuming that we have the time capacity to do it the second way, either way works from our perspective. And I feel like with clients, again, you're giving them an option, you're, you're empowering them. And I think any time you can empower the client, it's a good thing. Okay, so I just want to clarify that. That's that's really very clear there. What you just said is you're working on one part of their home. They mention the other part, and you simply say to them, that's awesome, love to do it, here's your two options. We can complete what we're working on now under the agreed upon monthly fee that we've established and then start that when we've done this. Or I can tell you, I still need those fees to do what we've already contracted to do. But if you want to add that now and you don't want to wait, you can have another 20 hours and that will result in the, this raise of your monthly retainer to me or my, your monthly fee to me. That's right. I love it. It's very clear. It's very clear and it's I think it's a, a good balance um, because again when you're trying to do a fixed fee it's hard to manage you know if you know from from the designer's perspective it's very easy for it to get out of control and so I think breaking it up into bite-sized bits helps you control your time allocation to the project so if you're just thinking oh I have one big fee I've got a I don't know a ten thousand dollar fee over the whole project, however many months or whatever, controlling that feels unwieldy and I never could. But if I say, okay, well, I have a $10,000 fee and $2,500 monthly payments coming. Okay, let me focus on that 2,500 and how I'm gonna allocate that and break it down that way. And I just find it's so much easier. It's so much easier to, to manage for the designer and I think also one $10,000 payment or four $2,500 payments, it feels better for the client. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it just, it feels better, I think, for everybody. Right. I think that I'm really still stuck on the gold of the statement of, see, because I think what I, what I understand happens is that when you're standing there talking about the living room, whether it's the fifth visit in the, the third month of the project or not, it doesn't matter at what point of the project you're in. When the client then starts to say, oh, and how about the kitchen? We get the concept of, oh, you know, don't get involved in the kitchen, don't do this. But I love the stopping and the announcing 
that's terrific that you're interested in working on the kitchen. Do you want me to add hours to this project, you know, add hours to this month to do both? Or do you want to wait and do it later? I, I just have to, I had to repeat it again because it's so good. I have to say what's funny is <laughs> Nicole Heimer at Curio Electro, who we mentioned at the top of the show, does um all of things related to my website for me, right? So mm-hmm. if we have to put a new event on the page, if we have to create a blog post, and this is for both Window Works and for Luann Nigara, and we are on retainer with Nicole. And, yep. you know, what's interesting is, is I'm thinking exactly to what she said to me this summer when we were in the middle of really promoting and gathering information and building website pages to get the Power Talk Friday tour up and running. And about... A week and a half into it, she said to me, I need you to know I'm blazing through your hours here on this. Do you want me to go into window works time and do no window works work this month? Or do you want to add hours to the, the Luann Nigara part of the retainer? I love that. Right. It, and I and- was able to make a decision. Right. And didn't you feel empowered mm-hmm. and, and informed? And that, you know, she was kind of looking out for the best interests of you as a client. And absolutely. Yeah. I, and it was really the big girl that. conversation because the, 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 the conversation, the two ways that the two other alternatives, which are neither good, is to A, work for free. Like, oh, she thinks I'm going to do X amount of work on window works, but she's asking me to do so much extra stuff for Luann Nigaris. So I guess I'll just do it, which Nicole is never going to do that, by the way, because she's a smart lady and that's crazy pants. But as a newer entrepreneur, you sort of can get sucked into doing that, right? Or the other thing that would have not been good would have been to just keep plowing and then hit me with this big bill at the end of the month where I would go, what are you doing? And she'd say, what do you mean? What are you doing? You had me do 90 <laughs> extra things. And I'd be like, I know, but you should have warned me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and you don't think you need warning. You're a grown up. I'm, you know, every day emailing her 20 things to do. But the fact is, is that it is a nice courtesy and it does make you as the client feel like you're in the driver's seat. And there's nothing icky from your standpoint of doing that. I did not feel like, how dare you let me know how much money I'm spending with you and where it's happening, where we're tracking it right now. I felt like, thank you. I'm so glad somebody is keeping track of this for me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, honestly, from my perspective, having another few months or however long of continued reliable cash flow that's great (laughs) right right (laughs) there's no negative especially if you're liking the client and it's a good working relationship right yes if there is not a good working relationship, then, then the answer too would busy. be different. <laughs> too busy to start that kitchen. I'm so sorry. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So I like it. I know there's a thousand more things to talk about fees and billing. So for everybody that's saying, but ask another one. I'm moving on. Sorry. So here's what we're going to do. I want to hit this closure meeting before I let you go because sure. I know all of these six steps are very, uh, are very, very important, but this closure meeting is not something that we often talk about on the show. I do bring it up often in my one-on-one coaching that there must be the autopsy of the project. That's what I call it. Like the the valuation of what went well, what didn't go well, the closure with the client, the closure with the team. And so tell me what it means for you, Courtney, to have a closure meeting. The closure meeting is just so important in solidifying the ongoing relationship. So your project is done, but I view every successful client project, that client is now an ambassador for me. Mm. And they are now a source of business, potential business. So I want that last touch point with them to be really positive and to reflect that first touch point, which was all about listening and understanding them and empowering them. So the first touch point is about that and the very last one is about that. Now, it's a very informal process. You know, I don't have a schedule that I go through because I find that the discussion depends on what has happened in the project. So I kind of prefer to leave it a little bit flexible, but really the goal is to, you know, 
ask them about their overall experience. Um, you know, was the time frame you know shorter or longer than they expected? Was there anything unexpected? Was there anything, you know, were there any points in time where they felt um, uninformed or lost in the process? Um, was there anything that they particularly really liked about the process? Um, you know, I'm trying to suss out why would they recommend me or why wouldn't they recommend me? And if I'm hearing, you know, negative things, I would already know that, you know, the, the project would have, would have been, you know, going badly. Um, and, but I want to hear positive and, you know, not negative, but, you know, constructive criticism. <laughs> right, right. It's important. Um, and, you know, so for instance, with hourly billing, you know, I would, you know, hear often that that was kind of hard, you know, because they kind of wouldn't know what to expect. And, you know, I knew that that was hard for the clients to, to sort of, you know, wrap their, their hands around. And it took time for me to be comfortable enough to move away from that structure. But, you know, that that's constructive criticism, you know. Right. So I think that it's really it's less. I think that the the best way to handle it is to guide. But listen, like the whole thing is is just being like kind of an open mind, you know, like like empowering them to, to tell you the truth that it's so helpful to you as a, as an entrepreneur, you know, that you really respect their opinion and, and, and all of that. And it, it kind of goes back to that phase one. It's kind of the same thing where, you know, this is your opportunity to, to, to say what you really feel and think. And at the end of that conversation, they love you. <laughs> mm, yeah, right. They're like, she's the best. Yeah, you know, maybe XYZ wasn't perfect and maybe, you know, MNO was, but in, at the end of the day, they're going to walk away with a positive impression and it's all about the impression. It's all about I, the impression. I love it. And how do you, I know that I hear you, that you do it differently per client and what's organic mm -hmm. and feels right. But what mm -hmm. are some of the ways? Do you sometimes just have a telephone call? Do you sometimes meet them in person? What, how, what are some of the ways that you have had this conversation? Well, my favorite way to have it is to go and meet them at their home. Okay. And usually, and again, this is not a long, you know, this is like a 20 minute you know, this is not a long, elaborate conversation, but it's informal, you know, I'll bring a, a, you know, them a little gift or like a bottle of wine or something like that. And just say, you know, yeah, you know, we, you know, I'm always looking to improve and, you know, would love to, you know, hear your thoughts about, you know, this issue and that issue. And, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, you know, what do you think? Like really have it be like, I'm asking your opinion because I value your opinion. Okay. And so does that mean it sounds like to me, which I'm not um, a sp a placing positive or negative on, I'm clarifying. Sure. It sounds like to me that you're not necessarily announcing, this is our closure meeting. It will take place at two o'clock at, you know, at your <laughs> residence. You're more or less, are you, it sounds like you might be just like, I'd like to stop by and just thank you and show my appreciation to you. Can I, we do, can we get together Tuesday at two o'clock? And then you bring the gift and then you just casually through conversation ask this, whatever questions are appropriate to this client and conversation? Or do you say, I always like to have an, an exit conversation with my clients. Do you mind spending some time with me? It'll take 20 minutes. Which way do you actually do it, Courtney? So I actually, I say it the second way, mm. but I execute it the first way. Okay. Okay. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So you announced that you, there's an intention for the meeting, yes. which is to have the, the conversation, the exit conversation, but you don't make it this, you know, board meeting and all people must be present and check in. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And if it's been that you've worked with a couple, do you have any uh, intention that you want both c people present or do you just mostly whoever was your point person had, do you have any feelings on that? I don't. It's it's whoever was my point person is the most important. But if the couple, if they can both be there, absolutely. But it's the point person, the person who was really the most involved, I think is the most important feedback. 
Mm-hmm. So, and they're the one who's most likely to talk to other people about you anyway. Exactly. Because right. at the end of the day, the goal is twofold. It's number one, to get constructive feedback and to improve the process. But number two, it's to get that referral. Right. And do you actually have any conversation in this closure meeting about referral or do you just let the experience speak for itself? Um, I do mention, I say, you know, and of course, you know, if you, if you have any friends or family, you know, please do keep me in mind, you know, right. So I, 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 yeah. Subtly. <laughs> yes. Right. We're not. And this is the next thing I do on my list. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And but then... it's really, it's easy and organic because at that point you have a relationship with the person, yes. you know, you know so each other. it's, you know, each other. So it, it's a pretty, it, it's, it's not as hard as it sounds. No, I can, I can imagine it. Well, listen to me. I'm speaking for everybody. It's not hard. Go ahead and do it. <laughs> now, <laughs> um, I think that it is, what it, the, the thing about it is, is if it does feel like it might be hard to do. So if you are listening now and you're just wrapping up a project and you're feeling like, that sounds like a good idea, but I feel like it would be hard to do, I need you to at least try to do it because it is as that exactly as Courtney is saying it is so valuable and so so few people actually look at another person and say I want to know what you thought of this process that's that that look in somebody's eyeballs and say it's important to me to know the kind of experience that you had working with my firm would you share that with me that's think about like if the chef came out of the restaurant and said before you go please tell me what did you think about my cooking you're like the chef wants to know what i think right it's <laughs> it's true it's true i i have to say like i can't tell you how beneficial it's been to be a, the kind of person who strives to value, you know, mm-hmm. what another person is saying mm-hmm. and simple kindness, mm-hmm. simple yeah. kindness. It gets you so far. And it's I true. think this falls into that category and it, it means everything. I, I, and really this whole thing at, at root I always think, you know, if I was my client, what would I want? Mm -hmm. And this is what I would want. Well, and that's the thing. And that is the little nugget for, for someone who is feeling uncomfortable possibly doing this or insecure about doing it is to recognize it is a gift that you're giving your client. Don't take your head out of it. You know, you just spent this X amount of weeks or months with a client and think about you don't you you wouldn't be uncomfortable to walk in and share a bottle of wine and give it to them as a gift. This is a gift too. This is actually a much more meaningful gift. I value your opinion and I'd love for you to share it with me. The opportunity to share what we think of something is a, a unique opportunity and we don't often get it in this world. It's true. It's mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. I, I like it. I like it. So now the interesting thing is that I also took this to have a component internal. Do you, cause I am a strong uh, proponent of having the internal autopsy, the internal uh, of the, of the project evaluation. Do you do that as well, Courtney? I wish I had a more formal process for that part of it. Okay. After the conversation, I take my notes and I think about it and I try to, you know, say, okay, I look at my process and I say, okay, this is, you know, where they commented. I don't have like a formal process though, where I sit down with my assistant and we kind of go through it or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's something I should, I should yeah. do. I yeah. would love to see you yeah. add that because you have yeah. so much going on already. And I would just love to see you add that layer to your process because that's where you look to see, you know, did we stay on track with all the hours that I said, did, you know, Mm -hmm. was this project profitable? You'd be surprised how many times I have worked with business owners who think they're making money and they're not, they're just moving money. (laughs) Oh boy, I know. And I am, I, I mean, I'm such a 
like I love going through my books. I'm yeah. Kind of, yeah, no, kind of... I know you're more intentional than 90% of the people out it's there. From but the, that from breaking dollars, it down, you know, that yeah. breaking it down to really see what, you know, if if the margin wasn't what you thought it would yes. be, you yes. learn something in that evaluation of where it went wrong and what could you could do the next time. So, um, you know, but I know that you are handling your business front and center from finance out. So, but you know um, what they, they also say, I think the go, saying it goes something like what you track is what yes. changes or mm -hmm. improves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and so mm -hmm. it, it's that's why it's like keeping an eye on your, you know, your operating margins and your, you know, it's not just the revenue and just understanding all of that and, and making, ha have it be a fun part of the business. Because mm -hmm. if, if I'm looking at the numbers and something is going awry, right. then you n next day, I am like, that is front number one. <laughs> exactly. See, that's what I'm saying. When you have those, when you have those evaluations, then you can make immediate changes as opposed yeah. to the end of the year and looking at this big P and L and like, all right, I guess that was good. It's, yeah. it's on, you do that as well. Of course it's important, but it becomes, um, you know, it, it just be, it's, 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 it's just like anything else. It's when you start to see the little successes that you earn based on the little additions to your process that you put on it gets you it gets you excited to repeat that process and that evaluation the next time it's like i learned that last time what am i going to learn this it time does. and so. I, I like your idea to kind of apply that thought process to something that's not like a numbers thing but but really like sort of the the um efficiency side mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm, process, mm -hmm. you know, like, like purely, okay, they, they gave me some feedback on this step. Okay. How can I jigger like, you know, our actual mm -hmm. physical work product? Mm -hmm. I really yeah. like that. I'll tell you the other thing too, is just to like belabor it a moment is sometimes, especially as your, your company grows. Okay. So when you are a smaller company and you as the principal probably have your hand on every invoice, but as your company grows and you have layers between you, simple things like maybe there is a receiver that you have used for several years and you as the principal are expecting what I don't know what receivers charge if they charge on the percentage of the product or the pounds. I have no idea. That's, I don't do that. Right. So, <laughs> but the point is that there are places that you spend money on a regular basis, month after month, year after year, as part of doing business. And as you get further removed from being the one who sees every invoice, it becomes it, it there there becomes a possibility for the gap to open up and some of your money to go falling through and what i mean is say for instance a receiver mm -hmm. I, I, what how does a receiver charge is it based on the percentage of the retail value of the product or the poundage how does a receiver charge just so i can um, use an example that you guys use yeah i think different receivers are different the one that that we work with um if it's just warehousing they have like a monthly fee and then for deliveries it you know is by location and how many men and Okay. And all of okay. That. So say you are running your firm, you're involved in every aspect and now you grow, you add two people. And now all of a sudden there's, you know, you're not unaware of what's happening in your firm, but the particular receiver you use, maybe when you were the one, re you know, reaching out and making all of those arrangement arrangements, it was $200 for a two man delivery. And now mm -hmm. it's Two ninety five for a two man delivery, but the person working for you now doesn't know that it used to be two hundred, and it or they don't really know mm. that they should tell you that it has gone up. And my right. point is, is that as you grow, you need a mechanism that keeps you as the principal in touch with your expenses. And we find that at Window Works that the autopsy of every project is the great way to do it because I might learn something. I might look at Adrian and say, wait a second, that's supposed to cost X, Y, Z. And she'll say, oh no, they raise their prices or they change this. And then we either go out and get competitive pricing and find out, did everybody raise their pricing on this or just this guy? Or we mm -hmm. turn around and maybe I have a conversation with them and I say, dude, what are you doing out here? I've been your customer for 25 years. How come you did this to me? Or I might find that 
this is the go. You know, this is the, his price is higher, higher than everybody else. But he's so good and he's so valuable that I'm willing to stay. But the point is, it's informed. I just don't mm-hmm. have that money running out of my business, and I don't know about it. And you Makes know, sense. I it absolutely makes sense. And I think as designers. I mean, there are so many moving parts and so many, you know, third parties we're dealing with. And so getting efficient and good at that can feel overwhelming. And so, you know, the advice I would give is start, start with one, start Mm -hmm. with one vendor or with one, you know, expense line item and just start from there. Mm -hmm. And eventually you'll get there because if you try to do it all at once, it can be very (laughs) <laughs> right, right, right. Intimidating. Right. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And I just, but for me, I know that there is one way that you run your business when you're a solo. Yes. And there's a very, it's a very different animal when you have even two or three employees. But if you don't run your business as a solo, as if you had two or three, it's going to be even more overwhelming and yes. more balls in the air that are dropping when you add the people. And so I always say, run it now like it's a big firm. Do it yeah. for this reason. Right. That's what, that's my whole goal is, you know, while I'm, you know, I'm one with an assistant, but, you know, part-time assistant. So it's, it's really me, but I want to be set up, you mm-hmm. know, so that when the time comes, when I'm really ready to add on that, that next person, that I mean, I am like kicking, you know, streamlined, and yeah. So I, I oh gosh, that's such good advice. It's yeah, so no, true. Yeah, it's the only way you can do it. So, alrighty, let me tell you what we could do, go two more hours. <laughs> I mean, I say that often, but it's often true, and in this case, it certainly is. We didn't even do two, three, four, or five. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but you are i have to say it hashtag smart lady you get one i need a dong a dinger donger for that whenever i say that i'm definitely gonna have to come thank up with that thank you well like i said i'm i'm a big fan of the podcast so getting the hashtag i'm i'm uh, smiling ear to ear right now <laughs> <laughs> oh thanks so much for spending your time with us courtney thank you luann Before I share my specific thoughts on my conversation with Courtney, I want to take a minute to talk about Article.com. One of my favorite things about Courtney is that she has the process and vision for her firm clear for herself and her clients, and that's exactly the same with Article.com. They have defined their brand as mid-century Scandinavian-inspired design for sofas, chairs, office and outdoor furniture, and accessories. Add to that their easy order process and the team of interior designers working in the two to the trade division and you have a recipe for success success for you and for your client see what they're all about today visit them at welldesigned.article.com okay so please use this link welldesigned.article.com that's how they know that you heard about it from the podcast now courtney Courtney has defined a six-step process. It's right there on her website for potential clients to read and for them to help and to help them understand what it will be like to work with her. We have had many designers on the show share how they have this, and you know I love this. I love it even more if it's not just words on your website, but something you actually follow. But here's the thing. The secret sauce is in the clarifying the finite details in each of these steps. So whether you have six steps, eight steps, I don't care how many steps. The truth is when you set your business up properly, the six steps are just the beginning. The next step that you have to take is you have to break down each of these steps into full detail and clarity. Okay. Remember Bonnie Fahey, episode number 375. Bonnie is an expert at the hiring process for virtual assistants. And she had said in that episode, a particular line that resonated with me. She said, once you have written out a process for doing anything, anything in your firm, And you think you have it really tight that you looking at it, you read it. Yep, this is a great process for a client intake questionnaire. This is a great process for, you know, how to purchase, you know, a sofa. She said to go and give it to someone who has no idea 
how to do what you do and see if they can go through the steps that you have written down and complete the task identified in that process. If they can do that, then you have a clearly defined process. Okay. I just had this conversation recently with someone comparing a process for running your business like baking. I honestly can't remember if it was on my show or in an interview I did on someone else's show. But the thing is, what we talked about is you can't give someone a recipe for blueberry pie and simply say, hey, grab a couple of packs of blueberries, some butter, some flour, some sugar, and put it in the oven at 350. Because you know what? When you do all that, it's going to taste amazing and you're going to love it. I mean, the thing is, you know that that's absurd. You know that it leaves out all of the details of how those ingredients become that amazing blueberry pie. Okay. But that's kind of what it sounds like to our potential client. And by the way, to our employees, when we are training them, when we talk about a process and we only hit the broad strokes and we leave out all the details. Okay. If your details are missing because you have not documented them, you have some work to do. Now, What's the payoff for doing this excruciating detailed work of writing the recipe for each of our processes? And believe me, I know it is. I I, I promise you, I know it is. Okay. But there are benefits. And Courtney mentioned two in particular that she has experienced because she finally took the time to get clear in her processes. Okay. The first benefit is that it gave her confidence in setting and asking for her fees. Okay. Because she had a defined process. She knew she could successfully run a project. And when you really, really know that, then you don't worry about the money conversations because you know, working with you has value. And it's not like you're just saying the words to your client, trying to convince yourself along with convincing them. It's that confidence of absolutely saying, I know I can do this well. I know I can deliver a project to you well executed. And see, when you feel that in you and you know it to be true, your whole presentation is different. There's a, there's a, There's a mojo behind it that is just sensed and it's a a transference of confidence from you to your client and your client grasps it and your client says, I'm going to be in good hands with this interior designer right? So I mentioned Rachel Cannon. She was episode 306. Listen to that episode too. She said the exact same thing. So if you need like a double dose of, okay, okay, I believe you, (laughs) that's where to get the second dose. Okay. Now, The other benefit that Courtney described was that when she became confident in running the process of the project, she learned it actually increased her creative confidence, okay? Courtney talked about how she felt like, you know, making better decisions for her clients that might just be a little bit out of their normal comfort zone. She felt confident in doing that because she was confident in her whole business process and it sort of just spilled over. Okay. So where the client might have been a little hesitant to be brave in a design selection or something like that, because Courtney was self-assured, they easily transferred their trust to her. Okay. So this, this is, do not skip by this. Do not underestimate. Okay. This is a very powerful combination. A potential client has an opportunity. For example, let's just say a potential client is going to interview two interior designers. Each of you have beautiful websites with fabulous portfolios, okay? But one of you in the initial intake call and in the first consult presents your work, your how you can expect to work with me, what the project timeline looks like, discusses budget with ease and as a matter of fact, because in essence, it is a matter of fact, okay? One of you is clearly the leader in the room and this allows the client to feel that they will totally and truly be in good hands. The other is hesitant, uncomfortable, stating fees is all over when asked how it's done and how does it work and is vague when timelines are discussed. I mean, who do you think gets hired? And here's the thing I wanna tell you. If you are walking through that process 
and you are thinking to yourself, well, I don't really have it all locked down, but you know, in the conversation, I'm good. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm good. If they hit me with a question, I have an answer. What I'm asking you to understand here is the difference between being okay or being pretty good on your feet and thinking like you're getting through that presentation and knowing you are. You see, when you know you are, you are, and it is understood. And when you are doing the very best you can, you're not quite locked down and the presentation's a little creaky. Yes, some people are going to go for it and others are not. But here's the thing. When that potential client selects the other designer, I'll bet you 10 bucks for every designer who is not hired, they blame it on the economy or the area that they're in or the competitors on the internet. You know, it's just not true. It's not. If you lose a project that you know was your right target ideal client and that you were right for, it's probably very much in the way you manage to convey how you will lead and manage the project. Hard truth, but so often so true. Okay, it's time for some big girl or big boy panties here. You need to look in the mirror. You need to do the prep work if you know that's what's lacking in your business. But when you do it, the business follows. The 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 clients come through the doors. I promise. <laughs> I do. All right. Now, are you feeling inspired? I hope you are. I get so many messages in a week from you telling me how much you learn from the podcast and how hopeful it makes and how it makes you feel about your ability to grow a business that fulfills and supports you. My question is, are you taking the next step? Are you taking action? You must turn that inspiration into action. I will accept nothing less from you, okay? A concept without execution is worthless, all right. If you find it hard to connect the action because you aren't sure how to do it or you lose steam or you just don't know where to start or you have no accountability, I want to tell you, join me in New Jersey for Luann Nigara Live. It's about the conversation. Come spend two days with me, with my Power Talk Friday experts, Nancy Ganskalfer, Nicole Heimer, Michelle Williams, Fred Burns, Kay Whitaker, Peter Lang, Eileen Hahn, Shauna Lynn Simon, Claire Jefford, Sarah Danielli, Stacey Brown Randall, and Mark McDonough. Imagine being able to hear these accomplished, smart people tell you in person how to build your firm. Imagine spending time with them during breakfast, lunch, and dinner, picking their brains, digging in, and pushing through the gray areas in your mind about how to set up your systems, your messaging, your hiring process. This is, I promise you, unlike anything else in the industry. This is us being together for two days, two and a half if you opt for the VIP before it closes out. This is us spending that time together. This is access. This is conversation. This is learning. This is connecting. This is turning inspiration into action. Don't overthink it. If you need this kind of opportunity to take your firm to the next level, whatever that level is for you, please do it. Sign up. No excuses in 2019. All action, all accountability, all achievement. Go to LuannLive.com and decide today to be with us, to show up and create your success. I'd really love to help you with that. Have an excellent day. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one -on -one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.